everyone. Welcome to another edition of Lunchtime Storytime. I'm glad to have you back. Today, in addition to our normal Paddington, I will be reading Dragons Love Tacos by Adam Rubin, illustrated by Daniel Salmieri. I love dragons. I love tacos. So I'm very excited about getting to share this book with you. Hopefully you can see the pictures. But there we go. Hey kid, did you know the dragons love tacos? They love beef tacos and chicken tacos. They love really big gigantic tacos and tiny little baby tacos as well. And there's, a, there's a little bitty dragon and there's a dragon and there's a dragon and there's a dragon. There's so many dragons in the illustration. Why do dragons love tacos? Maybe it's the smell from the sizzling pan. Maybe it's the crunch of the crispy tortillas. Maybe it's a secret. Either way, if you want to make friends with dragons, tacos are key. Hey dragon, why do you guys love tacos so much? You can see here he has a little carryaway full of tacos. But wait, as much as dragons love tacos, they hate spicy salsa even more. They hate spicy green salsa and spicy red salsa. They hate spicy chunky salsa and spicy smooth salsa. If the salsa is spicy at all, dragons can't stand it. That makes them like me because I don't really like spicy salsa either. Look, he has a cookbook that says, no spicy salsa, a guide to dragon cuisine. Why do dragons hate spicy salsa? Well, just one drop of hot sauce makes a dragon's ears smoke. Just one single speck of hot pepper makes a dragon snort sparts. Spicy salsa gives dragons the tummy troubles. And when dragons get the tummy troubles, oh boy. If you want to make tacos for dragons, keep the toppings mild. Tomatoes, lettuce, cheese. These are all good toppings for tacos for dragons. Hey dragon, how do you feel about spicy taco toppings? Here he is taking a little bit of a nap. Dragons love parties. They like costume parties and pool parties. They like big gigantic parties with accordions and they like t tiny little parties with charades. Why do dragons love parties? Maybe it's the conversation. Maybe it's the dancing. Maybe it's the comforting sound of a good friend's laughter. The only thing dragons love more than parties or tacos is taco parties. Taco parties are parties with lots of tacos. If you want to have some dragons over for a taco party, you'll need buckets of tacos, pant loads of tacos. The best way to judge how, the best way to judge is to get a boat and fill the boat with tacos. That's about how many tacos dragons need for a taco party. After all, Dragons love tacos. See, we have a boat called the SS Taco, full of tacos. Hey dragon, are you excited for the big taco party? Here he is marking the taco party on his taco calendar. Just remember, dragons hate spicy salsa. Before you host your taco party with dragons, get rid of all the spicy salsa. In fact, bury the spicy salsa in the backyard so the dragons can't find it. Look at all these dragons coming to the taco party. These dragons love your taco party. They love the music. They love the decorations. They especially love the tacos. Congratulations!
Look at this taco party. It's so much fun. This dragon has a taco. This dragon has a taco and a lampshade hat. This dragon has two tacos. This dragon has a taco. This dragon is considering a taco, but he's first giving one to his dog friend, which is very polite. And this dragon has a taco in each hand and is giving his host friend a kiss, which is also polite if you ask first. It's a good thing you got rid of all the spicy... <gasps> Wait a second! What are those little green things in the salsa? You didn't read the fine print! Totally mild salsa now with spicy jalapeno peppers dragons listen to me do not eat those tacos those little green specks in the salsa those are jalapeno peppers they are super spicy i know you love tacos dragons but you are not gonna love those tacos do not let those dragons eat those tacos Crunch, crunch, crunch. Everyone is eating the tacos. Oh dear. Too late. Here we see the aftermath of all the spicy salsa. dragons help you rebuild your house? Maybe they're good Samaritans. Maybe they feel bad for wrecking it. Maybe they're in just in it for the taco breaks. So see, we see everyone rebuilding the house like very polite guests. And then there is a taco lunch buffet. This little dog is asleep, which I think is the best choice. After all, dragons love tacos. The end. So there are other Dragons Love Tacos books. There's a sequel that I'm waiting on getting in the mail. So I will read that when I have the chance. But I also have dragons and I love tacos. So that is one of my favorite books. And now for another chapter from the Paddington Treasury. We are now in part three, a very good bargain indeed. Chapter 12 is called Paddington and the Finishing Touch. And here we see Paddington with some rocks. I don't know yet what he's gonna do with them, but I bet it will be entertaining. <clears throat> Mr. Gruber leaned on his shovel and mopped his brow with a large spotted handkerchief. If anyone had told me three weeks ago, Mr. Brown, he said, that one day I'd have my own patio in the Portobello Road, I wouldn't have believed them. In fact, he continued, dusting himself down as he warmed to his subject, if you hadn't come across that article, I might never have had one. Now look at it. At the sound of Mr. Groover's voice, Paddington rose into view from behind a pile of stones. Lumps of cement clung to his fur like miniature stalactites. His hat was covered in a thin film of gray dust, and his paws, never his strongest point, looked for all the world as if they had been dipped not once but many times into a mixture made up of earth, brick dust, and concrete. All the same, there was a pleased expression on his face as he put down his trowel and hurried across to join his friend near the back door of the shop so that they could inspect the results of their labors. For in the space of a little over two weeks, a great and most remarkable change had come over Mr. Groover's backyard. It had all started when Paddington had come across an article in one of Mrs. Brown's old housekeeping magazines. The article in question had been about the amount of wasted space there was in a big city like London, and how, with some thought and a lot of hard work, even the worst garbage dump could be turned into a place of beauty. The article had contained a number of photographs showing what could be done, and Paddington had been so impressed by these that he had taken the magazine along to show his friend. Mr. Gruber kept an antique shop in the Portobello Road, and although his backyard wasn't exactly a dumping ground, over the years he had certainly collected a vast amount of trash, and he had decided to make a clean sweep of the whole area's 
For several days, there had been a continual stream of junk dealers, and soon afterwards, builders' trucks became a familiar sight behind the shop as they began to arrive carrying loads of broken paving stones, sand, gravel, cement, rocks, and other items of building material too numerous to be mentioned. Taking time off each afternoon, Mr. Gruber had set about the task of laying the stones for a patio, while Paddington acted as foreman in charge of cement mixing and filling the gaps between the stones, a job which he enjoyed no end. At the far end of the yard, Mr. Gruber erected a fence against which he planted some climbing roses, and in front of this they built a rock garden, which was soon filled with various kinds of creeping plants. In the middle of the patio, space had been left for a small pond containing some goldfish and a miniature fountain, while at the house end there now stood a carved wooden seat with room enough for two. It was on this seat that Paddington and Mr. Gruber relaxed after their exertions each day and finished off any sticky buns which had been left over from their morning elevencies. I must say, we've been very lucky with the weather, said Mr. Gruber, as Paddington joined him and they took stock of the situation. It's been a real Indian summer, though without your help, I should never have got it all done before the winter. Paddington began to look more and more pleased as he sat down on the seat and listened to his friend, for although Mr. Gruber was a polite man, he wasn't in the habit of paying idle compliments. Mr. Gruber gave a sigh. If you half close your eyes and listen to the fountain, Mr. Brown, he said, and then watch all the twinkling lights come on as it begins to get dark, you might be anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. There's only one thing missing, he continued after a moment's pause. Paddington, who had almost nodded off in order to enjoy a dream in which it was a hot summer's night and he and Mr. Gruber were sipping cocoa under the stars, sat up in surprise. "'What's that, Mr. Gruber?' he asked anxiously, in case he'd left something out important by mistake. "'I don't know,' said Mr. Gruber dreamily. "'But there's something missing. What the whole thing needs is some kind of finishing touch, a statue or a piece of stonework.' I can't think what it should be. Mr. Gruber gave a shiver as he rose from his seat, for the once the sun disappeared over the rooftops, a chill came into the air. We shall just have to put on our thinking caps, Mr. Brown, he said, and not take them off again until we come up with something. Adrian Crisp, garden ornaments, exclaimed Mrs. Bird. What's that bear up to now? She held up a small piece of paper. I found this under Paddington's bed this morning. It looks as if it's been cut from a magazine, and my best shopping bag is missing. Mrs. Brown glanced up from her sewing. I expect it's got something to do with Mr. Gruber's patio, she replied. Paddington was rather quiet when he came in last night. He said he had his thinking cap on, and I noticed him poking about looking for my scissors. Mrs. Bird gave a snort. That bear is bad enough when he doesn't think of things, she said grimly. There's just knowing, no knowing what's likely to happen when he really puts his mind to it. Where is he, anyway? I think he went out, said Mrs. Brown vaguely. She took a look at the scrap of paper Mrs. Bird had brought downstairs. Works of art in stone bought and sold. No item too small or too large. I don't like the sound of that last bit, broke in Mrs. Bird. I can see Mr. Gruber ending up with a statue of the Duke of Wellington in his back garden. I hope not, said Mrs. Brown. I can't picture even Paddington trying to get a statue onto a London bus. At least, she added uneasily, I don't think I can. Unaware of the detective work going on at number 32 Windsor Gardens, Paddington peered around with a confused look on his face. Altogether, he was in a bit of a daze. In fact, he had to admit that he had never, ever seen anything quite like Mr. Crisp's establishment before. It occupied a large wilderness of a garden behind a ramshackle old house, some distance away from the Browns, and as far as the eye could see, every available square inch of ground was covered by statues, seats, pillars, balustrades, posts, stone animals, and the list was endless. Even Adrian Crisp himself, as he followed Paddington in and out of the maze of pathways, seemed to have only a very vague idea of what was actually there. "'Pray take your time, dear chap,' he exclaimed, dabbing his face with a silk handkerchief as they reached their starting point for the third time. "'Some of these items are hundreds of years old, and I think they'll last a while yet. There's no hurry at all.' Paddington thanked Mr. Crisp, and then peered thoughtfully at a pair of small stone lions standing nearby. They were among the first things he'd seen on entering the garden, and all in all, they seemed to fit most closely with what he had in mind. 
I think I like the look of those, Mr. Crisp, he explained, bending down in order to do undo the secret compartment in his suitcase. Adrian Crisp followed the direction of Paddington's gaze and then lifted a label attached to one of the lion's ears. Eh, I'm not sure you'll be able to manage it, he said doubtfully. The pair are 250 pounds. Paddington remained silent for a long moment as he tried to picture the combined weight of 250 jars of marmalade. I quite often bring all Mrs. Bird's shopping home from the market, he said. Adrian Crisp allowed himself a laugh. Oh, dear me, he said. I'm afraid we're talking at cross purposes. That isn't the weight. That's how much they cost. Two hundred and fifty pounds, exclaimed Paddington, nearly falling over backwards with surprise. Mr. Crisp adjusted his bow tie and gave a slight cough as he caught sight of the expression on Paddington's face. I might be able to let you have a small fawn for fifty pounds, he said reluctantly. I'm afraid the tail's fallen off, but it's quite a bargain. If I were to tell you where it came from originally, you'd have quite a surprise. Paddington, who looked as if nothing would ever surprise him again, sat down on his suitcase and stared mournfully at Mr. Crisp. I can see you won't be tempted, my dear fellow, said Mr. Crisp, trying to strike a more cheerful note. Uh, how much did you actually think of pain? I was thinking of fifty pence, said Paddington hopefully. Fifty pence! If Paddington had been taken by surprise a moment before, Adrian Crisp looked positively devastated. I could go up to one pound if I break into my bun money, Mr. Crisp, said Paddington hastily. <laughs> Don't strain your resources too much, Bear, said Mr. Crisp, delicately removing a, leaf of, a lump of leaf mold from his suede shoes. This isn't a charitable institution, you know, he continued, eyeing Paddington with disfavor. It's been a lifetime's work collecting these items, and I can't let them go for a song. I'm afraid I've only got one pound, said Paddington firmly. Adrian Crisp took a deep breath. I suppose I might be able to find you one or two bricks, he said sarcastically. You'll have to arrange your own transport, of course, but... He broke off as he caught Paddington's eye. Paddington had a very hard stare when he liked, and his present one was certainly one of the most powerful he'd ever managed. Eh, <clears throat> Mr. Crisp glanced round unhappily, and then his face suddenly lit up as he caught sight of something just behind Paddington. The very thing, he exclaimed. I could certainly let you have that for a pound. Paddington turned and looked over his shoulder. Thank you very much, Mr. Crisp, he said politely. What is it? What is it? Mr. Crisp looked slightly embarrassed. Uh, I think it fell off something a long time ago, he said hastily. I'm not sure what. Anyway, my dear fellow, for one pound you don't ask what it is. You should be thankful for small mercies. Paddington didn't like to say anything, but from where he was standing, Mr. Crisp's object seemed like rather a large mercy. It was big and round, and it looked for all the world like a giant stone football. However, he carefully counted out his one pound and handed the money over before that owner had time to change his mind. Thank you, I'm sure, said Mr. Crisp, reluctantly taking possession of a sticky collection of small coins. He had paused as Paddington turned his attention to the piece of stone. I shouldn't do that if I were you, he began. But it was too late. Almost before the words were out of his mouth, there came the sound of tearing paper Paddington stood looking at the two string handles in his paw, and then at the sodden remains of brown paper underneath the stone. That was one of Mrs. Bird's best shopping bags, he exclaimed hotly. I did try to warn you, Bear, said Mr. Crisp. You've got a bargain there. That stone's worth two pounds of anybody's money, just for the weight alone. If you'd like to hang on a moment, I'll roll it outside for you. Paddington gave Mr. Crisp a hard stare. You'll roll it outside for me, he repeated, hardly able to believe his ears, but I've got to get it all the way back to the Portobello Road. Mr. Crisp took a deep breath. I uh, might be able to find you a cardboard box, he said sarcastically, but I'm afraid we expect you to bring your own string for anything under two pounds. Mr. Crisp looked as if he'd had enough dealings with bear customers for one day, and when, a few minutes later, he ushered Paddington out through the gates, he bade him a hasty farewell and slammed the bolts shut on the other side with an air of finality. 
Taking a deep breath, Paddington placed his suitcase carefully on the top of the box, and then, clasping the whole lot firmly with both paws, he began staggering up the road in the general direction of Windsor Gardens and the Portobello Road. Here is Paddington carrying his package. If the stone object had seemed large among all the other odds and ends in Mr. Crisp's garden, now that he actually had it outside, it seemed enormous. Several times, he had to stop in order to rest his paws, and once, when he accidentally stepped on a grating outside of a row of shops, he nearly overbalanced and fell through a window. Altogether, he was thankful when at long last he peered round the side of his load and caught sight of a small line standing beside a familiar-looking London transport sign not far ahead. He was only just in time, for as he reached the end of the line, a bus swept to a halt beside the stop, and a voice from somewhere upstairs told everyone to hurry along. Quick, said a man coming to his rescue, there's an empty seat up front. Before Paddington knew what was happening, he found himself being bundled onto the bus, while several other willing hands in the crowd took charge of the cardboard box for him and placed it in the aisle behind the driver's compartment. He barely had time to raise his hat in order to thank everyone for their trouble before there was a sudden jerk and the bus set off again on its journey. Paddington fell back into the seat, mopping his brow, and as he did so, he looked out of the window in some surprise. Although, as far as he could remember, it was a fine day outside, he distinctly heard what sounded like the ominous rumble of thunder. It had seemed quite close for a second or two, and he peered anxiously up at the sky in case there was any lightning about, but as far as he could tell, there wasn't a cloud anywhere in sight. At that moment, there came a clattering of heavy feet on the stairs as the conductor descended to the bottom deck. "'Hello, hello,' said a disbelieving voice a second later. "'What's all this here?' Paddington glanced round to see what was going on, and as he did so, his eyes nearly fell out of their sockets. The cardboard box, which a moment before had stood so neatly and innocently beside him, now had a gaping hole in its side. Worse still, the cause of the hole was now resting at the other end of the aisle. "'This yours?' asked the conductor, pointing an accusing finger first at the stone by his feet and then at Paddington. "'I think it must be,' said Paddington vaguely. "'I'm not having no bears boulders on my bus,' said the conductor. He indicated a notice just above his head. "'It says here, plain enough, parcels may be left under the staircase by permission of the conductor, and I ain't given me... Permission, nor likely to, neither. Landed on me best corn, it did. <coughs> it isn't a bear's boulder, exclaimed Paddington hotly. It's Mr. Gruber's finishing touch. The conductor reached up and rang the bell. It'll be your finishing touch and all if I have any more nonsense, he said crossly. Come on, off with you. The conductor looked as though he'd been about to say a great deal more on the subject of bear passengers in general, and Paddington and his piece of stonework in particular, when he suddenly broke off. For, as the brush ground to a halt, the stone suddenly began trundling back up the aisle, ending its journey with a loud bang against the wall at the driver's end. A rather cross-looking face appeared for a moment at the window just above it. Then, the bus surged forward again, and before anyone had time to stop it, the stone began rolling back down the aisle, landing once more at the conductor's feet. "'I've had just about enough of this!' he exclaimed, hopping up and down as he reached for the bell. The words were hardly out of his mouth when a by now familiar thundering noise followed by an equally familiar thump drowned the excited conversation from the other passengers in the bus. For a moment or two, the bus seemed to hover, shaking in midair, as if one half wanted to go on and the other half wanted to stay. Then, with a screech of brakes, it pulled into the side of the road, and as it came to a halt, the driver jumped out and came hurrying round to the back. "'Why don't you make up your mind?' he cried, addressing the conductor. First you says you rings the bell, say you want to stop. Then you bangs on me panel to say go on.' Then you rings the bell again. Then it's bang on me panel. I don't know whether I'm on me head or me heels, let alone driving a bus. I like that, said the conductor. I banged on your panel. It was that blessed bear with his boulder what done it. A bear with a boulder? repeated the driver disbelievingly. Where? I can't see him. The conductor looked up the aisle and then his face turned white. He was there, he, ex he said. And he had this boulder what kept rolling up and down the aisle. There he is, he exclaimed triumphantly. I told you so. He pointed down the road to where, in the distance, a small brown figure could be seen hurrying after a round gray object as it zigzagged down the road. 
must have fallen off the last time you stopped. Well, I hope he catches it before he gets to the Portobello Road, said the driver. If it gets in among all them market stalls, there's no knowing what'll happen. Bears, exclaimed the conductor bitterly as a sudden thought struck him. He didn't even pay for his fare, let alone extra for his boulder. Paddington and Mr. Gruber settled themselves comfortably on the patio seat. After all his exertions in the early part of the day, Paddington was glad of a rest, and the sight of a tray laden with two mugs, a jug of cocoa, and a plate of buns into the bargain was doubly welcome. Mr. Gruber had been quite overwhelmed when Paddington presented him with the piece of stone. "'I don't know when I've had a such a nice present, Mr. Brown,' he said, "'or such an unexpected one. How you managed to get it all the way here by yourself, I really don't know.' It was rather heavy, Mr. Gruber, said Pitt and Paddington. I nearly strained my resources. Fancy that conductor calling it a boulder, continued Mr. Gruber, looking at the stone with a thoughtful expression on his face. Even Mr. Crisp didn't seem to know quite what it was, said Paddington, but he said he was sure it was a very good bargain. I'm sure he was right, agreed Mr. Gruber. He examined the top of the stone carefully and ran his fingers over the top, which appeared to have a flatter surface than the rest, and was surrounded by a rim, not unlike a small tray. Do you know of what I think it is, Mr. Brown? Paddington shook his head. I think it's an old Roman cocoa stand, said Mr. Gruber. A Roman cocoa stand, said Paddington excitedly. Well, perhaps it isn't exactly Roman, replied Mr. Gruber truthfully. But it's certainly very old, and I can't think of a better use for it. He reached over for the jug, filled both mugs to the brim with steaming liquid, and then carefully placed them on top of the stone. To Paddington's surprise, they fitted exactly. There, said Mr. Gruber with obvious pleasure. I don't think anyone could find a better finishing touch for the patio than that, Mr. Brown. Not if they tried for a thousand years. And here is Paddington reading and drinking from cocoa. So I hope you enjoyed the stories today. Tomorrow's chapter is called Paddington and the Christmas Shopping, and I will be back with another book as well. So in the meantime, take care of yourself, try to enjoy your day, do something fun, and I will see you all tomorrow. Bye!